25 d'agost del 2020, segona nit del Darulls a la ciutat de Kenosha, després que un policia disparés per l'esquena contra un negre al costat dels seus fills. Al carrer, tensió, incendis i una perillosa mescla de manifestants antiracistes i milicians d'extrema dreta armats i vinguts, diuen, a protegir negocis del pillatge. Entre ells, Kyle Rittenhouse, de 17 anys i fascinat amb la policia, es passeja amb un fusell semiautomàtic fins que, en circumstàncies confuses, un manifestant desarmat el persegueix i ell li dispara mortalment quatre trets. Al cap de poc, s'entrebanca i abans que l'ataquin, mata un segon jove i en fereix a un tercer, tots blancs. 15 mesos després s'ha celebrat el judici contra el jove pels progressistes, símbol del perill de les armes i d'una extrema dreta desenfrenada. Pels conservadors, un heroi que volia ajudar, que tenia dret a anar armat i a defensar-se de manifestants d'extrema esquerra. Everybody that you shot at that night you intended to kill, correct? I didn't intend to kill them, I intended to, I intended to stop the people who were attacking me. By killing them? L'acusació havia de convèncer més enllà de qualsevol dubte que Rittenhouse no va actuar en defensa pròpia, sinó que va provocar l'incident i va disparar sense motiu, però no ho ha aconseguit. Els membres del jurat han comprat l'argument de la legítima defensa i han absolt el jove de tots els càrrecs. Ell s'ha desmuntat quan ha escoltat el veredicte amb que el tornava a fer un home lliure. La decepció és molt gran pels familiars dels homes que va matar Rittenhouse i també per molts manifestants antiracistes. Denuncien que les seves morts quedaran impunes i que d'aquí temen que surti el missatge que civils armats poden circular per les ciutats, incitar a la violència, acabar matant algú i, al·legant legítima defensa, evitar que els passi. Hi, this is Bruce Rivers. Welcome to another episode of Criminal Lawyer Reacts. I am a board-certified criminal defense lawyer where I react to uh, some rap cases, I react to some music, and today we are reacting to Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, the, the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. Now, Kyle Rittenhouse, as you remember, was, is a 17-year-old uh, guy who was in Kenosha, Wisconsin, shortly after the shooting of Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake was shot, um, didn't die, but there were a lot of protests that happened afterwards. Now, uh, one of the things, and Kyle showed up with a medical kit, uh, with an AR-15, and a fire extinguisher. He was on top of some buildings and, and, uh, and acting as kind of a keeping the peace or protecting private property, which you cannot do with lethal force, by the way, unless it's your own home. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but today they're starting the opening statements in that case. This is a case that's happening in Wisconsin. Now, Mr. Rittenhouse is charged with uh, quite a number of counts. He's, charging, he's charged with uh, first degree reckless homicide. And the person uh, that is on the, the first count is uh, J uh, Joseph Rosenbaum. And we'll talk more about him in a little bit. Uh, first degree reckless endangering safety, Richard McGinnis. Richard McGinnis was a, a kind of a reporter that was uh, following uh, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse around. And then first degree intentional homicide. That was uh, the death of Anthony Huber. And we'll talk more about him in a minute. Um, attempted first degree intentional homicide of Gage, uh, I'm going to butcher this name, Grosskreutz, and he um, attacked him and had a firearm on him at the time. And then uh, first degree reckless endangering safety of an unknown male, uh, and then uh, possession of a weapon by a person under the age of 18, which you're not allowed to do. Um, anyway, so today is, is uh, their opening statements, and then we think we've gone over what an opening statement is. Opening statements are when you uh, basically showcase uh, the evidence. Now, I had a chance to watch some of the opening statements this morning, and vast difference between the defense and the prosecution. The prosecution did a traditional, the evidence will show, and, uh, and did a kind of a very probably maybe a 20, 25 minute uh, summary. The defense, on the other hand, uh, is doing something far different and really upset the prosecution and they had a little motion uh, hearing before it. The defense in this case um, 
showcased a lot of the exhibits that are going to be in this case. Almost made it look like the defense was more prepared. And I kind of think the uh, state got a little out lawyered in this aspect. So, you know, you get up there and you just kind of give a brief summary, and then all of a sudden the defense gets up and showcases the entire case with video, with uh, uh, photographs, with um, uh, a, basically a PowerPoint presentation. So what's going to happen here is um, once they get those uh, done, those opening statements are done, then what happens is the uh, state presents their witnesses. The defense has a chance to cross-examine the witnesses, and then the um, uh, the state would have an opportunity for rebuttal, and then they go into closing arguments. That's kind of the anatomy of, uh, of a trial. Now, this is a case of self-defense. Now, there's a, there's a thing called, there's three basic precepts in any criminal case. There's uh, the burden of proof, that rests with the government. So they, it's their case to prove. You have the presumption of innocence, and, and this will make more sense once I start talking about self-defense. But you're presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Not in the area of public opinion, but in, in, the, in a courtroom, that's a, a very fundamental precept. And then there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It's the highest standard in our judicial system. Now, before and we're going to react to this video, but I want to give you some framework about what we're dealing with here. The, um, what we're dealing with here is self-defense, okay? I'll just read it to you. Self-defense uh, is an issue in this case. This is the instruction. This is what the jury will hear at the end of the case. In deciding whether the defendant's conduct was criminally uh, reckless, uh, conduct which showed an utter disregard for human life, was a criminal uh, reckless conduct, you should also consider whether the defendant acted lawfully in self-defense. Okay, The law of self-defense allows the defendant to threaten or intentionally use force against another only if the defendant believed that there was an actual or imminent unlawful interference with the defendant's person and the defendant believed that the amount of force the defendant used or threatened to use was necessary to prove uh, to prevent or terminate the interference and the defendant's beliefs were reasonable at the time. Now, here's the thing. Remember I, I told you there's this presumption of innocence? Well, if, if the defense in this case gets a self-defense instruction, self-defense is presumed. And the state or the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act in self-defense. Let me run that by you again. It's not that they, you have to prove you acted in self-defense. They have to prove that you didn't. And it has to be from the standpoint of the defendant at the time, not in hindsight, you know, the jury looking back at, at, uh, at the situation. So let's kind of go through what happened that night. Um, when Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, he was originally confronted by a guy the last name of Rosenbaum. Um, and Rosenbaum uh, had just gotten out of a mental hospital for a suicide attempt. He was out on bond for domestic assault and had a no contact uh, with, I think, his wife or his girlfriend. He was really outrageous in confronting uh, Mr. Rittenhouse. And uh, in fact, at one point he can be see he can be seen saying, uh, "Shoot me, shoot me, shoot me." Think about the time that this is. The city is basically on fire, and you know everything is Kenosha, Wisconsin. So it's a smaller town. It's not like. Uh, New York or Chicago or even Minneapolis for that matter, but it, it's uh, a small, smaller town, uh, but still a big enough town that uh, there's a lot of people in the street. There's uh, destruction of property. You know, there's your typical stuff going on. 
So the uh, tensions are, are really high between the police and the protesters. But most people were protesting peacefully. Uh, but at some point, um, there's a confrontation between Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Um, Rittenhouse. And it's it's unclear as to as to what the physical confrontation was. We'll show you that here in a second. But that happened in one part of the city, okay? And then after that happened, and, and Mr. McGinnis, who's this reporter, he's going to testify in the trial. He was there and saw what happened and was rendering aid as, after Mr. Rosenbaum gets shot. And then uh, Kyle Ritt Rittenhouse takes off. And he's running down the street, and people start chasing him. And there's a few other confrontations, and that's where more shots um, ring out. So let's just kind of see what uh, we're what we're talking about here. So you see, okay, in the middle of the screen there, you can see um, the person that just ran to the middle of the screen. You see what looks like an old gas station boarded up, and the person with the gun there—that's Kyle Rittenhouse running away from somebody else. We don't know, and here's the thing, you can't use self-defense if you're the provocateur. In other words, you start a fight, you, you can't avail yourself of self-defense. You can revive it if you've retreated, but that's not what we have here. I mean, maybe we have that, maybe we don't. But we, we see him running away uh, from the person that I think is Rosenbaum. See, in the red, uh, the red um, arrow points to uh, Rittenhouse. And the red circle, that's Rosenbaum. And you can see he's chasing Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse is running away. So one of, the, one of the precepts I love in self-defense cases is where the other party closes the gap. When you close the gap, so I, I'm running away from you, you're, you're, I, it puts me in a defensive posture. If I'm closing the gap, I'm the provocateur necessarily. So from this standpoint, just from a self-defense standpoint, um, it's shaping up nicely for Rittenhouse. And you can see there's a scuffle. There's something going on that is not all that visible in this from this angle, but it, but the camera gets closer, and, and you can see there's uh, Rittenhouse right there, with his he's got his medical bag in the back, and Rosenbaum is on the ground, and the guy in the shirt right next to him, that is uh, McGinnis. So McGinnis takes his shirt off to render aid, and um, Mr. Uh, Rittenhouse is on the phone, and he's heard, I just shot somebody. So this, remember when I told you before, uh, some of these cases aren't really what happened. And I think that's going to be kind of the case in this. No one's going to say that he didn't shoot anybody. It's going to be, what does it mean legally? So you can tell that's him by uh, all the identifying features, by the medical bag, by the shirt, and by the hat. So that's Kyle, and then Kyle decides to take off. Now, I am firmly convinced that whoever he's talking to on the phone tell him to get the, told him to get the hell out of there. One of the things that you know the prosecutor raised in his opening statement was that he didn't render aid. That's always a red herring in a homicide case. If you're going to shoot somebody, are you going to help them? Probably not. And aid was already being rendered. So he, he runs down the street, down Sheridan Road, and that's where he has his next confrontation. So you can, you can see uh, Kyle's running down the road, and people are heard later saying, uh, what did he do? And then somebody, he shot somebody. So they're trying to catch him, and he's and he's running down, to really to go turn himself in. 
All right. Now, if we look at this first guy, he hits him. He uh, knocks his cap off. But when one person does something like that, it sort of gives license to other people to, to, to chime in, right? And he's running away. He's running away from the prior scene. He's not going there to attack people. That's a different, uh, totally different um, mindset than him going to attack somebody. So now you see all these people running after him. So, and here's the thing. I am not really taking a side. I'm just analyzing this from a criminal law standpoint, okay? Um, these are such loaded and um, highly emotional times. If you remember, Minneapolis burned to shit, and it was just awful. It was a very scary time for our city, and I'm sure they're going through something very similar at the time. So now we see him. There, now he falls on the ground. And when he falls on the ground, he's confronted by a couple things. One, he falls to the ground, but you he, he also hear gun, a gunshot go off that's not his. It's somebody else shooting in the air. First, some guy kicks him in the face. And then the guy with the skateboard is trying to take his gun. And what are you going to do when somebody's taking to take your gun? Is there a fear that they would use it against you? You're damn right there is. And we, if anybody's taken a concealed carry class, they tell you if, they t if they're going to take your gun, you use your gun. So he, the problem that I have with some of what he's, he's on the ground and he's being attacked. And you've got uh, the guy with the skateboard, um, he gets shot in the shoulder. And then the, um, this gauge, he's, a, he's got a gun on him. He has a firearm on him, and you'll, you'll see that here in this video. And he initially backs up, and uh, yeah, let's, no, we're going to play this again and slow it down. Now watch. See, the one guy kicks him in the face. Then he, he, he's on his back, and he's being attacked by the guy with the skateboard. And, the, you know, and... It may not be a deadly weapon, but it certainly is a uh, a weapon the way the skateboard's being used. And then, so the the man with the skateboard gets hit, and then you've got Gage uh, Grausowitz. And then what I don't like is is he's got his hands up like this, you know, and at at some point uh, Kyle puts the gun down. And it's at that point, you know, it's unclear as to what's going on, but he fires that fatal round uh, right then and there. And, it, and you're going to have to make the argument that he perceived him as a threat. He saw the firearm pointed at him and perceived it as a threat. That would be reasonable. If somebody's pointing a gun at you, you don't wait for them to pull the trigger. You pull the trigger yourself. So that's where the defense is going to go with this. And the way the defense has crafted these videos and put them all together um, was, I think, uh, genius. See, I don't like this. This is a very bad picture for the, um, for the defense because the guy has got his arms up like this. That's a very submissive uh, pose. But look where Kyle's gun is at the point. At that point, he's not pointed at him. It's pointed a little bit down towards the guy's knees. And then, but then he gets a little bit closer to him, and that's when the next, the final uh, final shot. Now, as I told you at the beginning of this case, the parties are doing their opening statements, and the defense has. Um, creatively put together a montage of videos and um, and this is from that evening in fact this is all stuff that they probably got from the government and generally speaking you, you don't admit evidence or you don't show the jury evidence that hasn't been admitted that's kind of an old um, rule it's not really even a rule but that's just generally if they if it's not admitted as evidence or it's not going to be you generally don't 
uh, the judge wouldn't allow it. But here's the deal. This is all stuff that came from the government. All this stuff is coming into evidence anyway. So if you're going to show them, uh, this is what the evidence is going to show. And I think this is this is really brilliant from the defense standpoint. Uh, now, let's kind of watch this montage. So you can see right there, there's Rittenhouse. See, you got a circle around it. And you can see him running. Or actually, he's not running at this point. This is the very beginning. And see what he says? He says, anybody need medical? Question mark. So that's what his mindset is. You know, this is the danger we have when we demonize people. Um, and... Uh, this is a you know this is a kid he went down there armed uh but he also had a medical kit with him and he's yelling out does anybody need medical medical that's a, that's a totally different mindset than than somebody that's out to kill somebody So you can see there's uh, there's Rittenhouse right there. Yeah, these stupid white people. These stupid white people. And you see them, you know, tipping over yeah, garbage cans. Yeah, definitely that trash can to put their garbage up. Uh, he's blocking the road. Now, here's the other thing. So now we have uh, a split screen, and this is uh, from the defense. Uh, but that was an FBI camera, uh, infrared, that shows the scene overhead. Ostensibly, I would assume it's uh, in time with what we just looked at. And see, and they switch back between uh, High definition camera and infrared. Uh, so a large crowd over here, smashing the SUVs. So there's Zeminski. I think his name is uh, Josh Zeminski. Okay, now here you have Rosenbaum and uh, Kyle Rittenhouse entering the scene. So you've got Rittenhouse at this point. This is very early on. He's, he's running down the street. See who he is. Now you, you you see him running into the uh, parking lot, and he's really being chased. Now, one of the things that the prosecution said early on is that um, Kyle Rittenhouse started this conflict, and they're just. And if you, if you look at this screen. Now we've got, uh, I think we have four different, or three different views. And you can see that he's being chased. And, and so now Rosenbaum just threw a bag at him. Nothing really in the bag, it doesn't look like. It certainly wouldn't rise to the level of, of uh, lethal force against him. But he is being pursued. And you hear a gunshot, but that gunshot is not Rittenhouse's gun yet. One, two, three, four. You hear that? That was Rittenhouse's gun. And what he does is he shoots uh, Rosenbaum at that point. So that gives you kind of the beginning uh, of how this thing unfolded. Now, when you have a self-defense case, you know, there, generally there's a duty to retreat uh, unless you're in a stand-your-ground state. So you can, you can reasonably think that you're in fear for your life. 
but a belief may be reasonable even though mistaken. In determining whether the defendant's beliefs were reasonable, the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the defendant's position under the circumstances that existed at the time of the alleged offense. The reasonableness of the defendant's beliefs must be determined from the standpoint of the defendant at the time of the defendant's acts and not from the viewpoint of the jury now. In other words, you can't look at it in hindsight and say, what a dumb shit, he should never have done that. You gotta look at it from his standpoint. So he's going down there. He is uh, he's saying, does anybody need medical? And he's got a medical kit with him. So that kind of uh, gives you the context in which he's down there. And then you've got this guy, Rosenbaum, chasing him and, you know, I'm not sure if uh, Rittenhouse knew of the prior statement. Uh, Rosenbaum says, uh, shoot me, shoot me now. And I think that was directly to Rittenhouse. So he knows the aggression that this guy has. And if, if that's the case, he, he, this guy does not have the boundaries and, and poses a significant threat. And Kyle Rittenhouse is running away from him. And remember what I said about closing the gap. You, he who closes the gap generally loses. Um, and that's what happened in this case. Now, there's two other deaths, or two, two other victims of shooting, but one other death. Well, first of all, this is uh, uh, Zaninsky. He fired a shot. And Rittenhouse's shots came two and a half, 2.5 to 2.6 seconds later. So he hears the shot. He's being chased. What would a reasonable person think in, in those circumstances? You know, me personally, I would have stayed away from that whole area. But everybody was down there, and and he was probably trying to do some good and whatever. And I'm not trying to, to defend him. I'm saying this is how the defense is going to paint this. And, and I'll be honest with you. I think he's going to win his case. I think Kyle Rittenhouse is going to get acquitted. Um, but you have uh, Zaninsky firing that uh, gun in the air. That frames him, you know, all of a sudden you hear, start to hear shots and he's running and he gets caught and I don't know if they were struggling over the gun or what, uh, but the, you hear the, hear the shots. And whether it was reasonable or not, after you, hearing what this guy said earlier, whether this would be uh, reasonable is going to be something for the jury to decide. Now, um, the other one is this Gage uh, Grosswitz. Let's kind of turn to, to his video made by, by uh, Rittenhouse. So it'll be interesting to see how the rest of this evidence comes into play. Because, um, like I said, if you remember, self-defense is basically presumed if they get the instruction. And I believe they'll get the instruction. You only have to have some showing of self-defense. And he's being chased. He's being attacked. There's going to be, uh, and, and the question will just be whether w what he did was reasonable. But the state has to disprove uh, self-defense, that it wasn't reasonable. If they can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it wasn't reasonable, then Kyle Rittenhouse walks. Now, when you, you know, they had jury selection last week, and I did find it interesting that the judge in this case um, had a uh, situation where um, they had jurors who uh, um, were sympathetic to, uh, to the protesters, and those people were dismissed as for cause. Then they had people who, or at least one person, who was a very pro Second Amendment um, and uh, didn't th and said, "I don't think I can be fair because I'm so pro Second Amendment." And uh, the judge and that said, "Well, I don't give a shit about your hands. I don't give a shit. I don't care about your uh, Second Amendment uh, views. I I want to know about this, this, and this." And he didn't strike him for cause. So, but I guarantee you that guy's not sitting on the jury. I guarantee he's not sitting on the jury because the, there's a thing called preemptory challenges. Two types of challenges. Challenges for cause, challenges for uh, any or no reason. Those are preemptory challenges. And so if, if you can't get them off for cause, you can kick them off for any or no reason as long as it's uh, race neutral. Okay? And so I, if the prosecutor has any smarts whatsoever, which I assume he does, um, 
you know, he would have kicked him off the jury. So we'll see where this case goes, uh, and we'll follow it, and we'll do updates uh, later in the week. But it, it's my opinion that I think the state is outlawed. I think they are, uh, the defense is probably better prepared, and you're going to watch. Uh, I bet you any money that he gets acquitted. Um, that's just a guess. I could be wrong. Um, you know, the, the charges, I read you the charges. Um, it's going to be, it'll be interesting to watch. So this has been another episode of Criminal Lawyer Reacts. I'm Bruce Rivers, board certified criminal defense lawyer. If you're watching this, you should sign up for Patreon. Uh, if you are watching this, you should sign up for, uh, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, subscribe, subscribe, like, follow, subscribe, do all that stuff. All the stuff you're supposed to do that I always forget to tell you to do, do all that stuff because it helps our channel and it helps you and I'm here to help you. So we'll see you next time on Criminal Lawyer Reacts.